My name is Jamie. I'm one of the pastors here. <laughs> I'm Kevin. I'm also one of the pastors here. And uh, I, I was telling Kevin um, recently, I, I was this week, I was in a conversation. Somebody looked at me. They were offering some observations about God. And then they looked at me and they said, well, what do you think? You're the theologian. <laughs> and I, 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 I didn't like that. No. I didn't like to feel it. I felt pressured. Um, because when I hear a theologian, I feel like I should have all the answers. Right. And so I wanted to go, I'm not a theologian, mm -hmm. but then I realized, oh, I am. And everybody, everybody is. is. Yeah. Everybody's a theologian. If you define theology this way, and I'm going to give you a definition, here it is. Theology could be defined as the effort of knowing God through study and observation. So at one level, we're all theologians. Mm -hmm. We're making observations about God. Even if you're an atheist, you're a theologian because you've made some observations. Now, you may have come to the conclusion that God doesn't exist. You don't need God. Well, yeah. you wouldn't need him because he isn't there. Doesn't do, yeah. But yes. you've made some observations, and mm -hmm. so thus you've drawn up a certain theology, a certain belief about God or a study of... So, from a certain perspective, we're all walking around theologians. Mm -hmm. The question is just really how much time we spend looking for God. I want you to let that drop in for just a second because I'd like for that to be a recurring question. How much time do you spend looking for God? Let me give you a passage of scripture. Um, Matthew chapter 15. And there's this interaction between Jesus and the teachers of the law. And they're called Pharisees. And if you've been around uh, most churches, they come up a lot because um, there's a lot of stories about them. Yeah. They're religious people, and some of them were very well-meaning, and, and they, they were the primary influencers of Jesus' day in the church. Mm -hmm. But many of them had a hidden agenda. The agenda was about control. It was about making money. It was about manipulation power. and power. Mm -hmm. And that comes up a lot in their interactions with Jesus. They're constantly trying to... to they're challenging him because they're trying to catch him so that they can regain their power because Jesus is having a great deal of influence. So this is one of those occasions, they come to him, they have a question, and they, they say this. Why do your disciples go against the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat their food. <laughs> now, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we talk about when you read something like this, this would be a good opportunity to get curious. You might go, wow, these guys are just, they're just really cleanly guys. Like, they just, before you eat, make sure you wash your hands. It just sounds like some good... Good old common sense. Or they're whiny parents. Or, or whiny parents. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they just, uh, you, so you might go, I guess they just want somebody to wash their hands. They just don't want any. Yeah. Or maybe there's more. If you took just a little time to look, you'd notice there is more. These Pharisees had create, created all these purity codes. So they'd taken certain laws from the Old Testament and amplified them, made them extra biblical, so to speak, and made new rules for people to follow. And one of those rules was that everybody had to wash their hands. Well, Jesus is pretty fond of breaking their rules, does that a lot, and um, so his disciples do as well. They're not interested in just following a purity code to try and meet their agenda. Jesus is often disruptive. In this case, he doesn't ask, answer their question, but he responds with another question. Why, Jesus replied, do you go against the command of God because of your tradition? So you're asking me as a rabbi why I go against? I'm going to ask you the same question. You go against God and your tradition too. By the way, you can say this to most legalists because almost anyone who is a legalistic person, there's going to be a fly in the ointment somewhere because they can't be perfectly consistent all the time. Someone who's constantly telling you about this is the perfect way to be eventually will show up imperfectly. And Jesus is pointing out, okay, Here's a place where you don't, do this. You, you don't do the same thing. So he just goes after it. He says, if anyone speaks evil of father or mother, they must certainly die. That's what the law is. And yet, you say, if anyone goes, says to a father or mother, what you might have gained from me is given to God, and they don't need to honor their father anymore. When you do that, as a result, you make God's word null and void because of your tradition. And what he's saying there is, basically, people would come and they were... Um, the Pharisees, they're going, hey, I've got this money and I'm supposed to take care of my mom and dad. And they're going, no, you don't. Send that into us, our political system, our synagogue, our church, and we're going to use that to consolidate our power. Well, but I'm supposed to honor my father and mother. I mean, it's like skipping over that. No, and so this was a circumstance, an occasion that was happening during the day, and Jesus, of course, points it out. He doesn't end there. He actually drops it in a little bit farther, and he says, you're a bunch of play actors. And he quotes the Old Testament. Isaiah had right words for you in his prophecy 
This people gives me honor with their lips. Their heart, however, holds me at an arm's length. The worship which they offer me is vain because they teach as law simply mere human precepts. And this is where we want to drop in today. This is part one of a two-part series. And we're going to talk a little bit about streams of theology. Now these are human precepts that have been framed to help us understand God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's really helpful because we're trying to organize our thoughts about God. But sometimes these streams of theology have actually been used to a violent end. A violent end. And that becomes problematic. So we're going to break down a couple, of, a couple of streams of theology. We have some mm -hmm. more for you next week. And we'll, yeah. we'll drop a little bit more into maybe putting a little bit more formation around how Journey sees our mm -hmm. understanding of God and our theology. Right. We're going to start from this broad place. It's going to feel a little academic on the front end because we've got to give you some definitions. We're going to talk about theology. But stay with it because somewhere along the way, you're going to meet someone, I promise you, in the church that holds to one of these two extreme positions, or at least they would call them diametrically opposed positions. Right. And, and they're, they're going to ask you questions about your faith. Now, you might be in one of these positions. You might go, sure. oh, that's me. Yep. And by the way, we're cool with that. This is called Journey Church. You can be anywhere on the spectrum. Join us. We're all in a discovery about God. Right. But if you go, I'm not really, I'm not into, like, why do we got to talk about theology? Because it's affected how we understand God. You've been affected by what Kevin's about to describe one way or another. So our hope is, like, let's just go backwards a little bit, pull that up, and then talk about how we currently interact with that theology. And I would slightly adjust what you just said, just rather than... Of course you would. A con yeah. <laughs> well, you're the theologian. What? Um, the, As are you. Uh, <laughs> Touche. So the uh, construct really is how we read the Bible or how we understand the Bible yeah. more than how we understand God. I think... I think we... Because the Bible is the portal to understanding God, so yeah, you're saying we're going so, here first? Right. They systematize the Bible ah. in such a way so that they can understand God. So really, the, the wrestling is with how we read it. Yeah. It, Good. It, both of us are, were in... We actually would have liked for them to spend a little bit more time understanding God. Yes. <laughs> that would Got have been, it. Yeah. yeah. Rather than try to just systematize the Bible in a way that that would better uh, frame out what they believe to be true about yeah. God. Good. So, but for us, we, we both grew up in the church. You grew up in it as a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. I didn't. But, um, but we were both indoctrinated into something. Yeah. As we, and what I mean by indoctrinated, um, the churches that you attended or the places that you went, especially as a kid, a lot of what we talked about was not, um, we didn't go, hey, is this our theology on soteriology? Is this, is this what we believe about salvation? Is this what we believe about end times? Is this what we, we, we just took it and said, oh, okay, this is what the Bible means. This is what it says. And there wasn't really a lot of alternate views of, of how that could play out. We were mostly said, this is the right way of believing. Right. And follow it. Right. And, and so when I turned uh, 26, I went to seminary in 1987. No, I wasn't 26. I was actually 24. My oh, bad. that's nice. Um, I'm not that I was old. still in high school. I'm not that old. I just thought I'd bring that uh, up. Anyway, 1987, went to seminary, arrived on seminary, having gotten a, a business degree, and never taken a, a formal Bible class. And I stepped into my first theology class, um, and the guy was speaking, as far as I was concerned, Korean. I mean, uh, every other word was so ter the, that All the ologies. Ologies. Yeah. And I was pretty lost. So, um, and not realizing what I had really stepped into. Were you I like, thought. I need to go home? Like, yeah. what did I say yes so, to? <laughs> yes, yes. All of those things. Yeah. I was like, I'm never going to pass this. Yeah. Anyway, long story short is, is that what, I, what that school taught me um, was that there are, there are so many different ways to read the Bible. There's so many different definitions. There's so many different things that, um, and that was the beauty of the school, actually. The beauty of the school was, we're going to teach you um, all the different strains of theology that there is, everything from um, very conservative to very liberal to very um, orthodox, very Catholic, very, they just gave We're us... teach you the whole different... Here it is. This is how they came to their conclusions, is, and you go believe what you want. 
A little, little different, different than your school. Than the school I went to. Uh, yes. Yours indoctrinated in, you in more of a way of thinking, more of a way of looking this at it. This is the way you see the world. And really, this is why we're talking about this today, is, is because all of us have been taught something. All of us have approached the Bible in some form or fashion with a theology in mind. And what I mean by that is, is that we have to be, we, we come to it going, how do I make this passage or this part of the Bible fit my idea of who God is? Yeah. Rather than the inverse. And so... And we were trained to come mm -hmm. to the Bible that way. Right. We were trained either unintentionally yeah. or intentionally. Yeah. It, but a lot of what gets deconstructed as you get older is, is that the Bible actually, we've talked about this, is sometimes inconsistent with itself. And you go, wait a minute, I read about this over here and now it says something different over here. How do I reconcile these two mm -hmm. things? And that's really what systematic theology tries to do, is it tries to reconcile two different opposing views. Yeah. So systematic theology is a p pretty big umbrella yeah. of which there are two dominant types. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There are kinds of theology like narrative theology or incarnational theology mm -hmm. that might probably be a little bit closer to the rhythms mm -hmm. of how we express ourselves as a church. But this has really set the frame for most churches. Protestant churches. Protestant churches in mm -hmm. America. And so yeah. we said, let's start here. Yeah, because you got to almost drop out of the Catholic and Orthodox. And then, because this is a product of the Reformation. Yeah. And um, the Reformation is the split of the Protestant church and the, and Catholic. the Catholic church. Yeah. Just, I, I don't know what, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So, so out of that came a, 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 what is called Reformed theology. If you ever heard of Reformed theology, it is born out of this place of when Luther separated um, and him and a few other reformers um, started studying the Bible through the lens of a scripture sola, it's scripture alone, um, versus the church and scripture. The Catholic church still holds to the Pope and to the church having authority over scripture, vice versa for the mm -hmm. Protestants, okay? So, so they're coming at it with this robust, oh, we get to study it, fresh eyes, fresh look. And so this, this main um, reform theology came out called Calvinism. Calvin, John Calvin wrote this book, a, a very extensive called Calvin Institutes. If you ever have insomnia and you want to read some really good, thick theology, actually, it's not bad reading. It, it's okay. Hmm. It's, yeah. You just got to drink a lot of water and stay awake. And, yeah, um, it's rich. It's rich, very rich. It has framed, oh. uh, I mean, how, I, I've mentioned oh. this before, but <clears throat> the United States government comes in some ways. Mm -hmm. Our understanding came from a lot of Calvin's teachings mm -hmm. and writings. In God we trust. So there's, a, um, so there's a richness of that. And so Reformed theology has basically five main tenets. And I'm going to tell you what those five are. And, and it's a, a primary way to, to study scripture. And the, and the first is they, they have a high belief in the sovereignty of God. And out of that high belief of sovereignty of God, meaning that God's in control of everything, that everything that goes on, God is not only aware, but interacting with and making it happen. And so with that comes the doctrine of election and, the election and predestination. So we are chosen by God, elected, and uh, it was predetermined before the foundations of the earth. Some people are chosen to follow God, and some people are not. Right, and they usually point like to Esau and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Before they were born, I yeah. hated Esau and I loved Jacob. Yes, um, they'll use those kinds of verses. Yes. Right, and right. there's there's verses in Ephesians where it talks about election, predetermined, predestined. Yep. You know, anyway, and in Romans, so there's you've got you've got the biblical basis for that, and then and then they talk about what is called limit, limited atonement. Limited atonement is that Jesus just died for the elect, so he didn't die for the world; he died for the elect, just the ones that would come to faith. And then the third one is, is that total depravity, that every human being on the planet is... Inherently evil. Inherently evil. And there is no good within them. Totally depraved. And Augustine, mm -hmm. one of the early church fathers, really <clears throat> drove that home. Which drives the election and drives limited atonement. Um, and then there's this thing called irresistible grace. Irresistible grace is when God draws you to himself 
Um, you cannot resist that. You can't say no. You can't reject God. So that also aligns with sovereignty, aligns with election, and aligns All with... All these things dovetail into one Yes, thing, yeah. and limited atonement. And then the last one is the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints is eternal security. Eternal security is that you, once you become a follower of Christ, you, you can never lose that. So you can never walk away. And that also aligns with election. It aligns with limited atonement. It lines mm. up with those. And so that, that framework is a systematic theology called Reformed. And it's how people... Now, it is it, it taken to its extreme. And it's, there's this thing called hyper-Calvinism, where it often, what it does is it... <clears throat> often might be a wrong word. But no, often's a good word. <laughs> it, it, it produces almost passivity in the followers of Christ to share... Christ with others. There's no point. Right. Because God's already predestined. He's already... Right. They're either in, they're out. Right. And, and would it be fair be, to say... Before the foundations of the earth, yeah. you were... Yeah. It would also be fair to say that in that hyper world, there's a... If there was a dominant way of being, there's a lot of um, a sense of rightness, maybe mm -hmm. the word arrogance, but just... It comes across that way at times. Yeah, okay. And, and it's a group, I, I mean, very clearly... Very they, academic, very scholarly. But a deep love of God, a deep fear of God. Ah, a yeah. Honest, the wrath of God is a big part of their language. Big deal. Yeah. Um, and all of that is... Um, it, it, it's wrapped up in... in um, rightness. And when you disagree oftentimes with people in this arena, you find yourself at odds, not just in terms of just a theological discussion, but it's, it, fears, it feels like there's, you've got to agree with me. And we're going to keep arguing until you do. Right. Right. One of the, one of the funny things about the school I went to, <laughs> we would have, uh, back in the 80s, they distributed papers that we called little newspapers. Um, around the campus to keep us updated on things that were going on around campus. And uh, every year there were days where if you were a uh, staunch Calvinist or a staunch Armenian, which we'll get to in a second, you would carry your briefcase. So if you were, carrying, if you were an Armenian and, you were, uh, and it was Armenian Day, you would carry your briefcase. Yeah. And then the Calvinists would do anything but carry a briefcase. Because they want to make it very, very clear. clear that they're not Armenian. So there's guys literally walking around with five-gallon pails with their books in it and they're, because they didn't want to be associated Don't with... Don't think yes. I'm an Armenian. Right. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. That I, sounds like I, a good time. And, and for... Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Scholarly place. Did you have like Martin Luther Day too uh, and yeah. Zwingli Day? Yeah. And... Uh, we didn't have a Zwingli oh, okay. Day. They weren't high on okay. that one. Okay. So Armenian... That's right. We're we're on a time here. Yeah, <clears throat> I didn't mean to make you. No, that's okay. You okay? Um, so the, yeah. out of this, out, yeah, calm down. Ah. It's already getting so violent. Calvin. So Calvin taught a lot. He had a son-in-law. Son-in-law started teaching, and Armenian Armenius mm -hmm. studied underneath John Calvin's son-in-law. And uh, he started to learn. He became a staunch Calvinist, believing those reformed tenets. And then he started to ask questions of it. He started, and there weren't good answers to it because he started studying the scriptures for himself. And he started to realize <clears throat> that there, were, there was an, a whole other set of ideas at play in the Represented Bible. Represented in the Bible right. that weren't being acknowledged. Right. So if you say Reformed, like Calvinists would be on this side, way to this extreme, mm -hmm. Arminius swung, swung the He didn't just kind of swing it to the middle. He swung it way over yeah. here. And he started to say, well, what about human responsibility? What about free will? What about these things? So he started reading the passages on free will, and he started asking the question, wait a minute, there's election on one side, and there's this free will on the other side. Human responsibility. Yeah. And, and if that is the case, and when Jesus said... Um, in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, mm -hmm. that he gave the only one side, yeah. that he died for the whole world. Yeah. Maybe not just for the elect. Yeah. And so the, for him, it started to unravel. And so as it started to unravel for him, he came up with a whole other set of, of contradictory terms on both, on, on, against what I would say would be classic Reformed theology. Yeah. Became this. You can lose your salvation in this side of it. Because it's all on, it's on you. It's, human it's your respons responsibility. God kind of takes an a observatory view yeah. rather than a proactive view. Like, I love you, but it's up to you. Right. Yeah. And so you, you find both of these things in Scripture, too. 
I mean, they're not, it's very clear in scripture if you read Hebrews in, in that passage, it seems like if you read it, you go, hmm, maybe you can lose your salvation. Hmm. Yeah. Um, if, and, and then you read other passages, never let anyone snatch you out of my hand. Maybe I can't lose my salvation. Right. Um, the idea that um, I'm already loved uh, versus I hate or wrath. I mean, it's, both of those things are there. And so he constructs this other systematic theology called Arminianism, and it's juxtaposed to this idea of Calvinism. And I'm not saying either of them are wrong. I'm saying actually is that they're both right in their, but they don't, what they don't do is they don't bring them together. There's a spectrum in between there. And, and the reality is, is to, to hold them both is to hold a paradox. Yeah. And somewhere in the minds of man is the inability to bring together the free will of man that he can actually reject God, which if you go to the Garden of Eden and you understand what was taking place in the Garden of Eden, this is where Arminius goes. And he says, look, he, God put them in the garden and they didn't have a sin nature. They weren't totally depraved. They actually were good and they're placed in this garden and they're given a choice moral agency, you can choose or not choose, you can do what you're gonna do, you can do what you want, but if you choose of this, then you will know good and evil. And we all know what happened. Yeah. And I don't think it took very long. <laughs> so you have this overlay for a lot of Christianity where there are basically mm -hmm. these two primary thoughts in Protestantism. Mm -hmm. I have to believe this or I have to believe this. Right. And then what starts happening along the way is people go, I don't think they got it all right. I don't think they got it all right. right. I think there's, as you said, I think there's both. They've, they've, dis, they've stumbled onto some truth in both of these elements. Oh, definitely. But we think there's a third way and a fourth way and a fifth way. Yeah. And what's happened throughout all of then Christian history is you have people trying to organize their thoughts, some of them into a new system, some of them into, new, into a new narrative. The system tends to be closed. This is the way we just re, we're just yeah. coming up with a new system. Right. Will you agree to our tenets, our doctrines, and right. join us in this mm -hmm. systematized way of believing? And then you have this other way of thinking that goes, well, this is actually a little looser than that. Mm -hmm. And there's a narrative, an incarnational way, meaning mm -hmm. we are actually placed in a body and we're meant to experience God not just in the words of a book, but in relationship with Him mm -hmm. through nature, through the transcendent. Yep. And that there, this book was actually written in narrative form, mm -hmm. and we're meant to discover Him in the stories, and we're meant to find ourselves in those stories. And so you have these other ways of beginning to see the Bible, okay. and which begins to broaden. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a tendency for us sometimes to look at this and go, well, out of a lot of this came a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for us to even look backward with some kind of judgment, because here's the deal, like, there's a lot of violence that erupted because of these two extreme ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. There's this thing called the 60 years war, there's a 30 years war. There, I mean, there's massive People fighting. Were burned at People the stake. were burned at the stake because of this. Mm -hmm. um, John Calvin burnt some people at the stake mm -hmm. because of this. Um, you know, they, so you look back and you go, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not a good way to run the church. Yeah, um, John Calvin was a Frenchman who had a church in Switzerland. <laughs> and, and you're just like, hey, I don't think this is a, I don't, I, this, doesn't, this doesn't seem consistent with other parts of scripture. Right. And we can look back with a lot of frustration. I certainly have in some of my journey. There have been times I look back historically with even some anger. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's important for all of us to realize, I gave you this quote from my friend Judy a few weeks ago, but she said, one generation's solution is often the next generation's problem. Mm -hmm. And let's remember that some of these people are reacting to some pretty horrific things happening in their day, and they're trying to get a footing. They're trying to get a grounding yeah. on how to interact with God. Yeah. Arguably, we're doing the same thing yeah. as a church. In our day, in our culture, we had a lot of questions about faith. At Journey Church, we embrace the questions. Now, yeah. some churches are not into that. They don't like questions. Again, certainty is important. If it's closed, and mm -hmm. it's certain that you just say yes or no, we embrace a lot of the tension of the questions because we feel like we're actually meant to evolve in our understanding of God. Right. We think we're meant to grow as we interact with him. Mm -hmm. And that's a different way of understanding God. That way we can go, thank you for those who came before, mm -hmm. but we, in our culture, and as we understand things, especially in the world of the internet, we have the benefit now, some of us have Jewish friends, we have ways to understand some of the context better than we ever could before. Sure. We're seeing things perhaps we never understood before. Yeah, benefit. 
Yeah. That, that could go either way. Yeah. Um, let me give you a quote from Larry Crabb. He says this, when we value scholarly precision and doctrinal purity above a personally transformed encounter with the God who reveals himself in his word, when we fail to see that an academic grasp of scripture often leads to a proud appreciation of knowledge, more than a humble and passionate appreciation of Christ, we develop an orthodoxy that crushes life, hmm. and we miss the gospel that frees us to live. And so we're both saying to you, and by the way, we're, his, his Enneagram type, trust me, he's a researcher. He loves information. I love to read. My wife and I, we have books everywhere in our lives. We love to study. We love to read. I, 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 I'll give you 12 books to suggest to read right now. But it's not about just this. And it can't be. Because when we get lost in here, we're usually responding to something that's not love. And here would be a good test. Check and see, when it comes to your relationship with God, check in on the energy that you're feeling every time you feel like you're meant to be right. Actually, try this with anybody. The next time you're in a fight with someone you love, your spouse, a good friend, as soon as you feel the compulsion within you to be right, go, oh, oh, time out. I really feel strongly about being right right now, and Jamie suggested I check in with the energy. Hold on, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, that'll go over big. No, I, it could go well. Oh, it could, I right. think we should try it. Yeah, okay. So just check in and see, are, do you have fear or are you in a state of love? Why is it important for you to be right? Is it possible that fear is driving the need to be right? For instance, I better show up here or she's not going to respect me. I better show up here or I'm going to be small. I better show up here or I'm not going to have a voice. I, better, I should be smart. I should know this stuff. If I don't actually have an answer, I'm going to appear stupid. I, why is it so important to be right? Just check in. Because I would submit most of the time, you could track this all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. We pluck that fruit to go, I want to know good and evil. Because if I know good and evil, then I'm in control. And if I'm in control, then I get to be the little God of my kingdom. And I don't actually have to trust a bigger God. I don't have to live in the tension. Listen to what Peter Rollins says. He says, look, speaking of God is never speaking of God, but only ever speaking about our understanding of God. Take that in for just a second. It's a tough one. It's hard, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. it disrupts yeah. your certainty, and it disrupts the leverage that we sometimes use on other people. And that's the struggle, even with reading the Bible. That, that, that's really what this series is about. Because when we come and we've been indoctrinated into a particular way of reading the Bible or we've been taught a particular way and we have a theology that we try to place over the top of the Bible as we read it, we try to, if, if we are an Arminian, we try to explain those passages of... Through that view. Through, through that, that view. Lens, so yeah. if there's something on election or does, does something damaging to what we believe is our free will, we try to explain it away or because we, we cannot incorporate it because it's a paradox mm. we can't because because in the human mind you put free will and election together and they 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 collide they don't go together and so so the bible being so trustworthy and such an expression of god not god but his his words and you go okay how do i reconcile these two things you don't have to mm. he does those are his words and so if, if those two things don't have to be reconciled, and they can be reconciled by God, we can be certain that his election is true and our free will is a real deal. This is so good, Kevin. Well, we, we used this illustration a week or two ago, but we talked about how God is like an ocean, and we all walk up. Let's say, let's say he's the Reformed and I'm there. Anyway, we both, hey, walk, no. up with our, <laughs> we both, both walk up with our <laughs> cups. We take a cup and we scoop up some water, and I look in my water, and I go, you know, there's this little green thing floating around in there. Yeah, I got a black thing. You got a black thing. I got a green. And I'm like, God is green. He's really watery, no, green. No, 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 he's salty. black. Salty. He's black. No, no, he's green. He's green. No, he's black. No, he's green. Does yours fly? <laughs> no, there's nothing in here that flies. It's just water. It just swims? There, there is a little swimming thing in here. Yeah, so God swims too. Right. Like this, do you understand? This is us arguing about God. <laughs> just take this in for just a moment. 
If God is this divine mystery the size of an ocean, we get a little scoop and go, well, this is my version of theology, and I'm trying to argue with you to prove that this is right. Yeah, and if you don't agree with me, that bothers me. Yeah. And now I'm afraid that I might not be right. Yeah. And now I'm and afraid I'm that I don't right, know God. Yeah. And if I don't know God, what does that mean? Then I'm getting a new glass of water. Because <laughs> I don't want yours. Yeah. Because I definitely don't like that one. Right. And that would prove to me that I was wrong. You see, the dance just goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me give you another important line. In many theological closed systems, this is our biggest problem. When we explain away the mystery, we explain away God himself. That's so true. God is not a mystery we're trying to solve, but rather a mystery we enter into in order to be transformed. So instead, you dive into the ocean. And you used to go, this is what it's like, and it might be different tomorrow. Right. But this is what it's like. I don't, I don't contain this. Right. He happens to contain me. Mm -hmm. And this is where... And in, some personalities prefer to wade in. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah. If that's how you want to get in, some are like, yeah. yeah. And that's okay. This is the whole point about God. Mm -hmm. We don't have to control them. We don't have to contain them. We don't have to stick them in some little system and go, now we understand God. And when we do, we turn them into an idol. Because it's not God. It's just us attempting to language God. You can't describe the indescribable. You can't know the unknowable. And yet at the same time, he says, you can know me. You can trust me. My sheep hear my voice. Mm -hmm. So this is that non-duality again. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I, I can't know the unknowable and I'm deeply known and know God. Right. And somehow both coexist because he's God and we're not. And as, as I've said before, sometimes we get lost in the God being a noun part and we forget the God being a verb part, that God is literally the expression of love. That's why we get him in a Trinitarian form, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And he's inviting us into the dance of love. You can enter into that state of being or you can stay out here in fear. You can build your own little castle and world and hide out in your own little kingdom and point out things, or you can actually dive into a relationship with God that is completely unpredictable most of the time. Well, what do you do with all that un if God's unpredictable? You walk by faith. Which is what it is. See, but that doesn't discount the fact that the Bible, right, right, you know, it's, it, it's here. Uh, the Bible is... God breathed words. It's, it's God giving us what we need to know him. Hmm. But at the same time, not all of him. It is, it's arrogant. Eh, is that the right word? Sounds like a good word. Okay. <laughs> to think that human words could fully and substantially define God. Yeah, let me say it like this. We're never dealing with certainty, but only with probability. Okay. You're going to place your trust in someone or something. The question is always who or what. We here at Journey want to keep driving you to the Bible as a portal to get to know God. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the Bible and stop there, you're going to have trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the relationship with God was intended from the beginning. We go back to the garden, yeah. walk with them in the cool of the day, and, and relationship is eternal because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have been in relationship always. And so he's inviting us into this relationship. And these words are to bring life in that relationship, not to define all the mind of God. That's where we've gotten lost. I think so. And that's the struggle. And, and yet we, we, Kevin, I think for the folks out there who are going, okay, I get that. Okay. I get, I get, I, I have to walk in faith. There's an unknown thing. And I've even been baby stepping. Like I'm yeah, doing yeah. this. I'm going for it. I'm trying to get to know God, trying to get to understand mm -hmm. relationship. But I, I still, need, don't I need some kind of way to organize my thoughts about God? Mm -hmm. And one of the phrases we use here a lot is, yes, there is form, yeah. just no formula. 
Right. So there's still form. We have, if you said, hey, do you guys as a church have a doctrinal statement? We'd go, yeah, we got a statement. This is what we believe. Here are the forms around what we believe. And guess what? We're revisiting them all the time because we're evolving in our understanding of God. Mm -hmm. But we have some forms of what we believe. But if you go, is this a formula that works every time for everybody everywhere? We'd go, no. No. We don't believe the Bible was written that way. Because as soon as you do that, you pluck the relationship out of it. Think about it. As soon as you learn a thing... Um, let me give you an example. Those of you, have you ever taught your kid how to ride a bike? Mm -hmm. So I've got four kids, taught all four kids how to ride a bike. You teach kids how to ride a bike. You know, initially, your child really wants you close by. Yep. Stand here, Daddy, hold the thing. Yeah, stand, 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 yeah, stand yeah, here. Yeah, stand. Run alongside me. Yeah, run alongside me. Once they learn how to ride the bike, are they like, Dad, I just really want you to stay with me every time I get on my bike. It just feel really great if you just run alongside me. Yeah. No! No, I'd get old like, fast. heck yeah! Yeah. Where has this been all my life? That's right, freedom. <laughs> you know what? I'll, hey, can I go ride my bike to the park? Hey, can I go ride my bike to the store? Hey, can I go ride my bike? What happened? I now know how to do it. Yeah. You know, I got this thing down. And so I, that's the thing to remember is sometimes we're just looking for some fast way to do something so we can actually avoid God. If we can be honest with ourselves about the shortcuts we take to cut God out of our lives to get to certainty then we'll understand the proclivity that we have to just keep trying to drill down, shrink him into some theological presupposition that we can say we know about and then use to soothe our own anxiety and manipulate other people to do what we want them to do. Often, theology has been weaponized for that very reason. Are we theologians? Is theology right, helpful, and good? Yes. But you've got to go to the energy behind it always motivated by love and relationship. Yeah, and we see that in Jesus. Jesus is the, is the incarnation of the word. Yeah. And so Jesus comes in the flesh. He condescends to us. And, and um, Hebrews says it, that we, we get to see in, in full form God in Jesus. In case you're wondering what God's like, like look this at is, Jesus. Look at Jesus. This is what he's like. But in the next breath, he dies on a cross. So there's, and he comes back to life. And, and really, we are people of the resurrection is what we are. We're mm. people of that historical event. And uh, there is, there is um, to know that God, to know the God of the resurrection, to know the Jesus that walked the planet, to know that is is to know the fuller, richer mind of God. And Hebrews talks about it, that in, it's in this that we have our hope. Yeah. This is where we place our hope, that God is redeeming all things. Yep. Which is why I think sometimes when people, I've had people say that to me, man, you, you, you're a Christian, I know, which I'll typically try and reframe that a little bit, but when they say that, they're like, well, you, you know what your history is. You know what you, you're, you have, as a people have done. Yep. And I'll say, yeah, I do know what's in our history. And there might be some other things you might not be aware of that's in our history that are quite mm -hmm. beautiful as well. Yes. But God is redeeming all things. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times we were just interacting with God as we understood him at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, there's lots of other people who had nothing to do with God, but they were just wielding his name right. as a means to an end. Yes. Jesus is exposing that often with the Pharisees. You're right. And what does he do to go all the way back to our opening passage? He just says, where's your heart? Where's your heart? These are people who have precepts and laws and rules, but their heart is far from me. This is always the check-in. Most of the time we get lost in fear, we get lost in the academics of it all. We just, we're up in our head, mm -hmm. and we've forgotten what it meant to feel, to be in relationship, to recognize we were designed for intimacy and connection. And probably, mo if, you're, if there's any suffering happening in your life right now, you, you've got a relational fracture, financial crisis, you've, maybe it's existential, you're not even sure why you're here. You're, there's a, there's a, a meaning in life and purpose thing going on right now inside you. If that's your space right now, and you're in that place of suffering, is it possible that where it's felt like God has let you down, What if it was your understanding of God that let you down? Not God, but your understanding of God. And if that's happening, is it possible that there's a gap that's been created? 
I'd call that an opportunity to actually get to see God a little more clearly than you've ever seen him. Because the understanding only took you so far and then it collapsed. God didn't function like you thought he would. Did God change? Did God let you down? Nope. Your understanding took you so far and fell. Now you know what happens? You have another opportunity to know God in a deeper, richer, and truer way. You actually get to see God revealed in ways you've never seen him before. You step into the suffering. You lean forward in faith. You're invited now into a deeper trust. And God's going, I want to expand your understanding of who I am. Or, (laughs) none of that's true. And you and I really are in control of our destinies. God is not all things. He's not all powerful and he's not sovereign. And the truth of the matter is, we'd better work really hard to put some fail safes in our lives, redundancies on redundancies, because he's not worth trusting. And if that's the case, then think long and hard about how to orchestrate your life. If God's not trustworthy, think long and hard how to build your life. Because there's a lot to be afraid of. Sometimes I think we just don't see it as clearly as that. We get lost in the messiness of it all. But the question resounds, are you looking for God? Are you really looking for God? Or are you looking for something else? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with us? Let's do a brief reflection. Stare at the floor, close your eyes if you're journaling, keep journaling, whatever helps you focus. What is it that you're actually seeking? Certainty, control, power, wealth, knowledge. Are you seeking relationship? Are you seeking the transcendent? Are you seeking a way of being? Jesus gives that a term. He calls it the kingdom of God. It's a way of being in the world. What about the rhythms of your days? Do you notice where God is at play? Do you see it? In the eyes of your child in the blessing of your home, in the kind man who opens the door and the brother that gives you a hug, in the sunset, in the cool breeze, in the gospels, in one of Paul's letters, in the story about David, in a still moment of prayer. God just waits to be known. And he pursues us. There it is, that paradox. God waiting patiently like a gentleman and then another time a romantic pursuit. And they both coexist. The God of the universe created you and me in love, by love, for love. How will you respond? Father, I don't know why your design was for us to be your body on the earth. The church, just sometimes it seems like that there could have been a better plan. My limited perspective and my judgment, I come and I I bring my confusion and disorientation. But I speak that out, I confess it, and then I open my hands and say, Okay, 
if you want me and all this messed up stuff that's me you got me I'll be the church guys you've called us all to be your representation on the planet we're meant to be the light of the world and so God would you align us in your will and your ways and would we be the light in people's darkness God for those who are suffering in some space today I just ask that you would meet them at that point of need would you wrap your arms around them would you let them know that they're loved that they're seen and somehow in the tragedy of it all there's an opportunity to know you in a deeper way would you remind us all that you redeem all things that's what you do you are the restorer and through you we are more than conquerors we get to keep getting up over and over again So pull us like a magnet into joy. Guide us into spaces of peace. Would we persevere? Would we walk with patience with one another? Would you continue to eliminate the fear? Immerse us in your love. Here are our songs we've set to music. This is our praise. Thank you for the gift of music that we get to use it as a modality, as an expression of love. And so here we are, your children, singing songs about how much we love you. Please receive it in Christ's name. 